Hello, Joanna and Sharon. Good evening, Professor. How are you? Who am I or how am I? Oh, how are you? <laughs> I'm, I'm not bad, considering. Not bad, I am. There's always like a flurry of searching around for all the stuff I need to do the lecture and sort of a, a, um, a slow surrender to the fact that it's not gonna be together. But I'm doing okay. Mainly, I, mainly I'm, I have like way too much stuff to cover. So we shall see. Uh, for the poll that you sent, like yesterday, oh, yeah. was there supposed to be a poll attached to it, or were we supposed no, to just? No, it was just that. Like, it was a dumb poll. It was just like reply to the email and state your opinion. You know. Okay, I see. I'm leaning towards um. I'm leaning towards keeping it online for a variety of reasons, but um, uh, you know, I'm not, I don't like online classes, but there's, um, <clears throat> there's a 6 to 7.15 p.m. lecture and then a 7.30 lab back to back. And that is a bit of a stretch for me to be at work that late and that early. I mean, I, it's not impossible, it's just, um, you know, I'm old. <laughs> Not that old, but I feel that old, I guess. Hmm. Let's see here. There we go. But I was just like, <clears throat> I got like six or seven responses saying they'd prefer to keep it online, but nothing otherwise. So. Is there anybody, I mean, is there anybody who would prefer to keep it, um, um, would, would prefer to go back to in-person? How about you, Katie? I don't want to be on campus at 6 p.m. Okay, perfect. Okay. I mean, that's basically how I feel, too. But... It's just the it's just the lecture lab proximity thing that's <clears throat> a little bit difficult. So it looks like we'll keep it online. I mean, aha, uh -huh. I think that's that's a very good question about exams, and I think yes. Let's come in for for exams though, because it is really really weird for me to do exams online, and I don't like it. And I'm hoping you guys feel the same. There's only one. There's only one during the mid semester, and then there's one at the end. There's one midterm and a final. Yeah, if they don't do another lockdown, right? Yeah. yeah, and it's like also, you know, when you can do a pencil and paper or pen and paper exam, you can write shit in there like, this doesn't make sense, Dr. T or whatever, and you know, or you can like say, it's, it's kind of like this, you know, there's not like, you know, you can draw me a little picture or whatever, you know, that 
will help me to give you partial credit, you know? So that's, that's also good. <clears throat> Jeffrey, whoops. Partial credit for the win. Yes. I like that. Okay. So I think I'm going to start my video. Oh, geez, that's lovely, isn't it? Oh, well. I have a little bit of a glare issue, but we'll live with it. Most, mostly we're looking at notes anyway. And now, who's tuning in here? It's Elvin. Elvin Gutierrez. Oh. Hey, Elvin. Hello, how are you doing? Good. Good to see you. You got this picture, you're in your car or something, and the <laughs> your Zoom picture? Uh, not at all. I'm actually, that's a picture. Uh, there's a background. That's a, it's a same oh. San Oh, got it, got it, got it. Okay. All right. All right. Yeah. Well, anyway, so I should probably get on with things up because we've got a ton to cover and I am messing around. And as much as I hate it when other people do that, I am so guilty of it. So, um, oh, yes, we'll enable live transcription here. That way, if I use bad words, you guys have written proof of it. I'll tell you. Uh, let's see here. And now I'm going to share my screen. How do I do that? There we go. Share screen. Ah, share this guy. Okay. So, um, where we left off last time was we were looking at um, t-tests, right? And um, uh, t-tests are a way, um, well, um, first of all, First of all, you can you can always convert your data into convert the x axis of your data into z, right? Or z or t. And what that does is it takes your data and it puts it onto a universal Gaussian curve. And then you can use that Gaussian curve to compare with other Gaussian curves. So um, let me just try something out here. Hmm. Oh, here it is, here it is. Okay, now I'm going to share my little screen here. Hmm. Where are you? Where are you? Okay, new share. Whiteboard, there we go. Okay, so I'm gonna. Need to get a new, new whiteboard. There we go. <clears throat> so when you think about uh, a number line of observations, right? And you can make a few observations. Maybe you get some distribution like that. You know, it's gonna be random. And 
Um, you, with just a few data points like this, it's hard to tell whether something is Gaussian, right? But if you, if you know enough to make the assumption that, it, that it's Gaussian, then you can say something about it, right? You can say, well, then here is the mean, right? You can sort of take the geometric center of those data points, the center of mass, I should say. And um, let's say that um, that's the mean that's maybe one standard devi one standard deviation, right? So this is um, plus sigma and minus sigma, right out to here. <clears throat> and if you divide, if you if you if you take each data point, you know each x and y there. Let's say that's um, um, x, x1, y1. You say, well, um, actually, we're only thinking about x here, aren't we? You can take every x value and subtract out the, the mean, mu, and divide that by sigma, the standard deviation. And now you have. What this numerator does is it centers, uh, basically centers this whole plot on zero. So this zero centers everything. And this normalizes the magnitude to standard deviations. Right, and, and by doing this, then you can say, oops, low battery. How could I have low battery when it's plugged in? Ah, I see something's wrong with the plug. Well, hopefully it stays alive. Um, um, when you have it on this, on this, in this standard deviation space, it's like you've superimposed this model curve over it, right? This is a model, and this is the probability now of an observation versus the observation. And um, <clears throat> then you can say, well, you know, there's exactly in the ideal case, there's exactly 68% of the of the total 100% probability of this curve in between mu and minus sigma and mu and plus sigma. So in this interval, there's 68% of the total probability. Right. Does this um uh does this ring a bell with most of y'all or some of y'all or let me know how I'm doing. Alvin, you're the only one with the camera, so I'm going to keep picking on you. <laughs> that was no problem. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, it makes uh, so uh, it makes, kind of makes sense so far. Yeah, so far it's good. Okay. Am I going too slow or too boring or whatever? I don't actually don't answer that. Don't answer. <laughs> <laughs> you're going well. <laughs> okay. 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 <laughs> Kiara, how am I doing? John? 
oh my gosh, everybody's eating lunch or something. Okay, so um, now, so what this means really is um, you, you're trying to predict the, the true value, this, this new value, right? Um, and if you take more data, that, that value could move around a little bit, right? So, um, you know, and, but, and, and, the, and, the, and, and the curve could change shape. It could get narrower or fatter, right? As you take more and more data and you keep fitting it to this curve, right? And for every additional data point, you know, you just calculate X bar again, right? You know, it's just the sum of X sub I over N, right? And then um, S is the sum of X sub I minus X bar over that squared over N minus one square rooted, right? So as you add X's, you, you will change the magnitudes of S and X bar. But let me ask you just a sort of a weird thought question about this. Um, <clears throat> will it get, will S continue to shrink as you take more and more data? It's sort of like a yes or no question. Let's take let's take a vote on the chat thingamajingy. Mm. How do I get the chat back? I don't know. What's the hot key to get the chat on Zoom? It's like halt something or, oh wait, there it is, there it is. Chat, chat, okay. So somebody said, oh, uh, Snigda, Snigda said no, because the square root function plateaus, right? It gets closer to zero, but doesn't actually reach it. Yeah, okay, so, uh, the, the first answer there, no, is correct, right? Because <clears throat> for each time you add an X sub I, that X sub I could be greater than or less than the mean, right? And so this value here, you know, could be, uh, it can be, you know, once you square it, it's, it's, it's in a positive domain, you square it and then you root it, it's always positive, right? And so it's, it will have its own actual distribution, but um, uh, the, um, but it's not going to tend towards zero. It's going to tend towards a specific value, right? So this guy, Uh, a value, and we can call that value sigma, right? So in the limit of uh, many, um, so mu is really the limit of x bar as n goes to infinity, and sigma is the limit of um, s as n goes to infinity there, right? So um, you can use, and, 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 there's, and there's, well, let's just, I'll just throw in one more cool thing here. And it has to do with the square root part that Snigda actually brought up, which is that, um, if you if you need to know um, mu, 
right? And you can only measure it. And you can always only measure X, right? You measure X many times. And how does, how does your knowledge of mu improve with a number of measurements? Right. Well, it actually improves as um, the square root of n, right? So the um, the standard deviation of, of the mean mu or the mean x bar um, is equal to x bar over the square root of n. <laughs> I got a I got a rainbow I got a rainbow pen there for some reason. <laughs> Woo! <laughs> right. So um, so let's say if you made um, two measurements, uh, then you can say well. Um, my estimate of X bar is, let's say it's 10 plus or minus one, right? Then you could go for like, well, what if I had four measurements instead of two, I, I, I double, wait, no, let's, let's multiply by four, right? So we go two times four is eight. So we go from two measurements to, to eight measurements. Wait, no, that's not right. One to two to four to eight is, is the sequence that I'm looking at, and then eight to 16. And each time you double the number of measurements, you improve your estimate of X bar by the square root of two. So each time you quadruple them, you improve by the factor of two. So let's, let's say that um, you have X bar is equal to 10 plus or minus one, right? And that's for n equals, say, um, two. And then we're gonna say x bar is equal to 10 plus or minus one. Now n is equal to um, eight. And I'm asking you is how much better, how much more do you know going from two measurements to eight? Or how much better is your estimate of X bar? Or your estimate really of mu. Mu is the um, mu is the limit as n goes to infinity. Right. And the answer is that it is. Um, uh, the square root of two over the square root of eight, which is equal to one over the square root of four, which is equal to one half. Um, uh, better, and so so your new standard deviation of the mean. Um, is one over the square root of two. And here it's one out of two square roots of two. It's a half of that upper value. So you improve your precision by a factor of two by doing four times more measurements. And that's, that's, um, that's true in a lot of settings, a lot of different, um, uh, like in, in radioactive counting or in um, signal averaging or other settings like that. If you can improve, if you need to improve your signal to noise ratio, 
you have to increase the number of counts that you take. And if you increase by a factor of four, your estimate of the average improves by a factor of two. So um, taking that back now to um, the world of Dan Harris. Let's see, oops, did you new share? Meeting controls, no share. Uh, there we go. Um, then you can. Um, So you can improve with, with more n values. And, and the um, and there's a way to, to know exactly what the probability of your mean lying in a given interval is. And that's um, the confidence interval. And that confidence interval is, um, equal to Ts over root n, right? So um, if you know, you, you know, you, you always know x, x bar and s, these are your experimental data. And T is from a table. And then n is the number of data points that you took. So x bar, s, and n are, are really your data points. And T is from taken from a table, or you can use a spreadsheet to calculate it, right? And uh, T says, okay, well, um, X bar plus or minus S over root N, that's the standard deviation of the mean. But if you want to know the probability that the true mean lies within a given interval, you, you pick a T value out of that table, right? And um, you can say, for example, um, what we generally do in chemistry, unless we specify otherwise, is we use a 95% confidence interval, right? <clears throat> and you can say, well, um, if I have just made two measurements, what I need to do to be 95% confident the mean lies in this interval, right? This is an interval. To be 95% confident that the mean lies in that interval, I need to multiply that interval by 12.7, right? So we'll take S, the measure of standard deviation from your two measurements, right? Divide that by the square root of two and multiply by 12. And then we've got a, a range within which we are 95% confident that the true value lies. So, um, let me go back to, uh, oh, you know what? I think I'm gonna be, no, I've gotta do, do it this way, okay. Oops, oh, that's the wrong thing. Can I go back here? Hold on. Ah, screen share. There we go. There we go. So, um, so I feel like I'm kind of belaboring a, a simple point here, but, um, um, I think I got to uh, oh that the the meaning of the confidence interval, right? So um, if you have just these two data points here, right? You got a number line. You got a, two data points here. You know, say maybe eight and ten or something, right? <clears throat> and the the standard deviation is right here, right? And then, so that there's there's x bar there, right? It's 
plus s, that's minus s, right? And I would say, well, if someone asked me, what is the true value? Of, of, of say this X bar, right? They're asking what is mu, right? It's like saying, um, if you measure your weight on the scale um, two times and you get like, you know, if you're, if you're me, you get like 215 and 210, right? It's because I've got a big belly. <laughs> Son of a bitch weighs like 50 pounds, I think. <laughs> So um, if I do this twice, and I say, well, how much do I actually weigh, right? Um, I can really only say that I'm 95% confident that my weight is T for um, N equals one and 95% times one pound, uh, times, um, uh, so let's see, let's say this is um, two squared to two is the standard deviation there. So that's gonna be like, call it three pounds. Oops. Um, over um, the square root of uh, two, right? So this is going to be, this is going to go back to, this is going to be um, this value here is going to be equal to um, 12.7 times 3 over the square root of 2, which is about 24. So I can say with 95% confidence that my true weight, according to this scale, is um, you know, 212.5 plus or minus 24. Right? And you you might say that is complete, well, complete, completely overweight, of course. But you might also want to say that that's a huge interval, like 24 pounds. Oh my gosh. That's a huge number. And it is. Because you only have one degree of freedom. If I had, if I had, if I had another measurement, that would cut it way down, that would cut it way down. So let me show you how that would uh, change things. And that would change things by, instead of being 12 times, it would only be four times, right? And then as I keep in increasing the number of data points, this number gets smaller, but it never like goes to, it doesn't actually go to zero. So that's the meaning of the confidence interval. It's a value that um, tells you within what interval you can be X percent confident that the true true mean lies. So there's actually some, uh, there's some problems here, right? Um, yeah, let's, let's just look at this example problem here. The carbohydrate comp content of a glycoprotein is found to be 12.6, 11.9, 13, 12.5% by weight. Right, so they may they have these five uh, measurements in replicate analyses. Right, find the fifty and ninety percent confidence intervals for this value. Right, well, there's the there's the average. There's x bar, and there's one standard deviation. Right, 
And you can be 50% confident that the true value lies in this interval right here. But what if, um, what if you had somebody on trial for possession of cocaine and you said, well, I'm pretty sure that the cocaine content in his blood was, you know, 12 and a half plus or minus one. And I'm 50% confident. I could be wrong. And I'll, I'm probably, I'm only going to be right about half the time in making this statement. What, what, it, Somebody who's a, a forensic student, tell me what's wrong with that, making that statement that way. I know there's forensicists here. I know there are. Oh my God. The defense would argue that it's uh -huh. then it probably isn't admissible. Right. Because you could be, you're, it's like rolling dice. It's like flipping a coin, whether or not that statement is true. Right? Because you, you can quote a 50% confidence interval and it's a coin toss whether the true mean is in that region. Right? So if we use a 95% confidence interval, that's much a big improvement, right? So um, now why, now if you take the same amount of uh, data and you just say, well, I wanna make a, a more a, a better statement about the location. I, mean, I want to make the 90% confidence interval. That interval is here on the right. And that's a much larger interval. Why is it larger when you make, when you want to make it more certain? So no, the true mean lies between 12 and 13. And I'm 90% I'm confident that there's only a 10% chance that I'm wrong when I say that. Why is that larger than the 50% confidence interval? Is it because, um, okay. Is it because the fact that there's a larger range for what the mean could be means that there's less of a chance that you're going to get like an error. Yes. Because it can encompass so many values. Yes, exactly. Yes, that's the right way to think about it. So there's there's very small chance that it's it's in this large of an interval, right? Or that it's not in that large of an interval, right? The transcript says that it's not that larger dinner. <laughs> so um, the transcript should read, there is a very small chance that the true answer is not in this larger inter interval here. So, um, and let's see if we want to do this quantitatively then, right? We just take X bar, which is 12.5, S, which is, or no, um, T, the T value for the 50% interval is 0.741. S is 0.4 over the square root of five. That's the 50% confidence interval, right? And a much better one is 90. All right. However, generally we use the 95% confidence interval, right? So, 
So um, I'll let you guys do this one on your own. It's it's fairly uh, straightforward, right? And then if we want to look at this, right? Um, uh, this is an annoying little graph, but once you get it, it's kind of helpful, right? That each of these little blobs is a data point and a 50% confidence interval, right? And each of them is for four data points. And if you take these four and you define the 50% confidence interval, you see that in most cases, or in, in almost exactly half the cases, the true mean is within the 50% confidence interval and about half the cases it's not. However, if you use the 90% um, confidence interval, almost nine times out of 10, the, um, the true mean, which is this line going through there is included within that interval and only in a few cases is it not. So, you know, if you, um, if you were to go to the 99.9% .9 confidence interval on this graph, would the vertical bars be larger or smaller? Larger? Yes, they would, exactly. Yes, good answer. The bars would be larger. Coolios. Okay. So, um, so you can see that, like, here, here's a mean and a standard deviation, right? If you if you got this with five measurements, the ninety five percent confidence would be this wide. But if you got it for twenty one measurements, it would only be this wide. So this this actually here, see five times four is 20, right? And this shows that square root of n uh, thing, right? That um, this, this is about half the length of this. So the confidence interval, it's, it's reciprocal. It's like the square root of five over the square root of 20, which is a half, right? So um, most of this difference comes from square root of n, although some comes from the t value, which differs for five and 20 measurements. So anyhow, you can use spreadsheets, all is good, right? Now, this is, this is when you, this is um, uh, what we just did was um, uh, we said, uh, what, what is the true mean, you know? Oh, this microphone is off. Oh, Gerardo, your mic, your mic is on, and I, we can hear somebody talking there. And we'd love to know what they're saying. <laughs> that is my roommate. Not bad. All right. All right. All right. <laughs> okay. What is the mean, right? Then we can go from there, and we can answer a similar question, which is. Um, are two mean values different? Right? I'm sorry, that's probably not legible, but what it says over here is what is the mean? And what it says over here is are the two mean values different? Right? And here, what we're going to say is that they are statistically different. And, um, and again, we're going to get a yes or no answer to that by using a t-test. 
and we're going to we're actually going to calculate a t value and compare that to a tabulated value right and there's there's basically um uh I think there's four different ways to do this. Let's, let's see what they say. Right. Okay, so there's three different ways to do this, right? So there's comparing X, X bar to a known value, right? So you can say, you know, um, what we're gonna do in our uh, second and third experiments is um, we're gonna have a commercial um, Diet Coke. We're gonna measure the caffeine and say, is that equal to 45 mg, what they say it is, right? And then we're gonna do the same thing with the vitamin tablet in uh, experiment two. Um, and that is compare a measured quantity to an accepted answer, right? To a, it's like comparing X bar and mu, right? And depending on the T value that we get, we're gonna say, oh, these are different or no, that they, they are not statistically different, statistically different. So then there's, a, there's another case where you have two mean values, right? And then you're gonna compare them. Say so does, do these two, uh, experimentally determined mean values agree. And they both have an X bar and an S and an N, right? And, um, and you're gonna throw all that, throw all those six values in, get a T calculated out and compare that to a table, right? And then there's a weird case where you just measure um, one sample by two methods, another sample by two methods, another sample by two methods, another sample by two methods. You measure n samples by each of these two methods, then you can use those data to um, to get uh, an idea of whether the methods are giving you the same value or not. And um, we'll we'll cross that bridge in a minute, but. Um, the um, idea here is that um, uh, the the confidence interval, right? If your if your if your accepted value is inside of your confidence interval, then you say, oh, there's not a statistical difference between the value that I got and this accepted value. Right, this quote known value, right? So does the answer using a method agree with the known answer, right? And um, if, um, so like for example, um, if the, um, confidence interval for the method is 3.26 plus or minus 0 0.006, right? It just varies out in that third decimal. But 3.19 is the accepted one. Oops. Then there's, um, there's no way that these, that large of a difference can be reconciled if this is a 95% confidence interval, right? So these are statistically different. Or the different is statistically significant is another way to say that. Right. So, um, hmm. So now there's two of these stupid cases and we have to consider each one. And they're, they're, they're similar, but not quite the same, right? One is if the two populations, X bar one, X one and X two, right? If they have a very similar standard deviation, 
right? And if the standard deviations are similar, then you can use this method here to calculate T, right? So let's just look at this equation and pick it apart a little bit. T is X bar one minus X bar two divided by S and times the square root of that, right? So you'll see that it's like, if you rearrange it, right? You've got, um, the absolute value of the difference is equal to Ts over square root of n, right? That's sort of our rearrangement of this. But um, uh, but in this case, we're calculating a T value based on the difference in the mean values the pooled standard deviation and the pooled n value, right? And the pooled standard deviation here is S1 n minus one, S1 squared n minus one, S2 squared n minus and two minus one over n one plus n two minus two, two is for degrees of freedom, square root of that whole darn thing, that is S pooled, that goes there. And then you multiply it by n1 times n2 over n1 plus n2. And this actually favors, it's a little bit smaller than the smallest of the two. So if it's 10 and four, it's 40 over 14, which is about 3.8 or so. So it's a little bit smaller than the smaller of the two. That's a, that's a way to get that reduced value, right? So you get this T value from your data and you say, well, what's the probability associated with this T value, right? How, how confident are we that we could get this value of T from a, a population of, um, or from this difference, right? And um, so, um, so you can go through with all the, the data, right? And you can say that this T calculator is 0.3 and it's way less than T table of 2.1, right? 2.1 is for um, 12 degrees of freedom, right? And then because your T calculated, that's your, your, your difference in units of T is less than the difference in unit of T expected for 95% confidence to say, whoa, we cannot tell these two numbers apart, right? The difference is not significant, right? Cannot tell them apart. Right. So um, if you, um, let's say you're um, testifying in court and um, you, you measure um, this, um, say testosterone level, like you're doing a, a USADA thing, right? The Anti-Doping Authority and um, you test for this um, steroid in blood and you say, oh, well, that's higher than the average human value. And someone asks you, asks you to compute the T statistic, right? What you would do then is you would go back to, um, this method, right? This thing right here, right? And you would, and you would, um, oops. Uh, what would you do actually? Maybe this one here. 
no, that's going too far. So you would have to, you would, you would just use, um, you would calculate T and that's equal to X bar minus mu times square root of N over S, right? You say, well, I calculated a T value for this and it came out to, um, came out less than 95% confidence, right? So you calculated a T value for this um, uh, poor athlete's blood and it came out to less than 95% confidence when you compared it to normal undoped human blood. So what does that mean for the uh, athlete? Is he exonerated or is he guilty? Guilty. Ah, sneak that. Guilty of what? Doping. Guilty of doping. Okay. So he, what, we, what we did was we compared his blood to normal human blood, right? And this, when we calculated T, it came out to less than the 95% confidence level. If his, if his blood came out identical to human, the human blood, would this come out to less than the 95% confidence level? X bar is equal to mu, right? So X bar minus mu is what? Zero. Zero, good. Zero times the square root of whatever divided by whatever is equal to what? Zero. Zero, right? So all the, all the T values in the table are positive. Would this T value come out less than or greater than the T values in the table? Less than. Less than, right. So if they're equal, are they different? Slightly? <laughs> no, if they're equal, they're not different. <laughs> right? That makes sense. Right, right. So if they're equal, they're not different, right? So, um, so the small t values give insignificant differences, right? And the uh, poor runner who's uh, in the ADA court, his T value compared to an undoped human was zero, let's say. Is he guilty of doping or not? No. Exactly, right. Yeah, the, you can't distinguish his blood from undoped blood. Therefore, you don't, you, you, you cannot say that he's doping, right? Good. I like that. So, um, great. So this is how you do T-tests and whatnot. And I'm going to leave the nuts and bolts for y'all to sweat over and practice. One that's not so difficult, but it's a little bit complicated. So, um, I'll publish some, some results from this. I'd like to move forward just a little bit. Um, but also you can do this with a spreadsheet. You can just like put the, put the raw data in and then you can get a, a, a T value and compare it to a tabulated value and whatnot. And uh, that will show you. Uh, how to do that. There's also a thing called the Grubbs test for outliers. I'll let you figure that out too. It's not, it's not really too different, difficult. 
And I'd like to start our conversation about least squares today. And I'd like to talk about um, uh, how to model data, right? Least squares modeling, right, is basically what we're what we're going to do, and uh, we're going to have data, like it could be concentration and light absorption, right? In a mathematical model, which is maybe Beer's law. A equals epsilon BC, and you want to find the parameters that make the model and the data most nearly agree. So for example, you could have um, uh, data um, absorbance concentration, right? You know, 0, 0 and, um, you know, 0, 0, and then 0, 1, and then and then 0 0.2 and then 2.0 and then you can make a graph 0 1 and 2 right um, absorbance concentration get a best fit line here and the slope there you, we, we would relate to Beer's law a equals epsilon b times c so the slope of this line is equal to epsilon times b, right? But it's not limited to this. It could be um, the bond strength and the bond length of a diatomic molecule. You know, you can you can do spectroscopy and get the, um, the peaks. You can get the rate constant, rate orders of a chemical reaction, and many, many other things you can get using least squares. Yeah. So, um, uh, as an example of this, um, well, the general form of the linear function here is that some output variable y is equal to some coefficient b0 times some function f0 of x, right? And plus another coefficient and another function plus another coefficient, plus another function, right? Now, um, uh, an easy case here is y equals mx plus b. That's a straightforward linear function. And it has two coefficients, has b0 and b1, right? And um, <clears throat> If we let B0 be the constant, well, um, actually B0 is not one here, B0 is whatever it is. But if we say F0 is just the constant one and F1 is the value X, right? Then B0 is the intercept. and B1 is the slope, right? Because we have Y equals M times X. There's the, there's F1 of X. It's just X, right? And F2 of X, or I'm, or we could say F0 of X is just the number one. Right, and so that equates to M, which is X, or M times F1 of X, which is M times X, plus B times F0 of X, which is just B times one, right? So in this case, you can get a slope and an intercept out, and there's, there's other cases there too. And the question, the thing that I'd like to go through with you real briefly is, how you can derive um, the coefficients uh, B0 and B1 from uh, a data set like this, right? So um, it's actually probably a larger subject than we can tackle right now. Um, but let me leave you with a thought. 
And that thought is that whenever you have a data set like, like this linear one, right? You've got data points and a line, right? And what you're trying to do is minimize the distance between the points and the line, right? You're trying to adjust the slope and the intercept of that straight line such that on average, this line comes as close, close as possible to all the points. And what we do is we define a thing called chi-squared. Uh, and chi-squared is a function of m and b in the example that I gave, right? So what you can do is you can make a plot of chi squared versus a trial m value that you use, right? The m value is going to be the slope of this line. It could be higher or it could be lower, right? And what you'll find is that there's an optimum value of chi squared, right? Or there's an optimum value of n where chi squared is a minimum. And the same is also true of the intercept B. And so we'll talk more about this next time. What I'd like to do right now in closing is, um, let's see here, I've got to get a new share here. Uh, screen two. Oops, is that screen two? Can you guys see the, the uh, lecture PowerPoints thing here? Yeah, okay, good, excellent. So, so what I'd like to do is show you, for example, um, the, um, the, a little bit about the lab that's coming up. So we have um, uh, homework on, from chapter four coming up on the second, and that's, that's like um, Thursday, right? So let's see when the second, oh, that's Wednesday night, right? So, um, We'll do this, this homework is due Wednesday night, right? And we'll talk a little bit more about least squares on, on Wednesday. And we'll try to try to wrap up chapter four on Wednesday, right? Um, and, uh, and I'll probably do some problems from the homework set, but, um, but chapter four is due Wednesday night. And um, I would like to alert you to, um, the lab notebook, which is here. Ah, it's actually, I mean, I'll put it on the front page, but uh, one way to get to it right now is through files. And then from files, we go to lab. And then lab has these folders here for the different lab reports. And then it also has 155 lab manual S22. And this guy here is, has our each experiment that we're gonna do, and we're gonna do five of them during the semester. And here it is, blah, blah. And we're gonna do experiment zero uh, first, right? And, um, uh, this is sort of general stuff about the experiments, but um, here's, here's a very brief report for experiment zero. What we're gonna do is we're gonna measure the extinction spectrum and the, the maximum extinction coefficient of crystal violet. And we'll do a full error analysis on this. And, um, uh, and what we'll do is we'll, We'll follow the directions. We'll make a solution of crystal violet dye. And then um, we will um, take a spectrum of that. We'll do the error analysis, the uncertainty analysis like this. And then I'm gonna give you a, a spreadsheet template and you're gonna fill in the data here, this orange with black text. These are data points that you're gonna put in and this uh, wavelength and all the rest of this will be calculated. And then uh, what you, 
and you'll have to put in these calculations, but um, uh, what you'll get is an extinction spectrum, which is the extinction coefficient versus wavelength of uh, this die. And then you will pick off the maximum value. And that's, in this case, it's 43,000 plus or minus 1300. Right, so that's what we're going to do on our for our first day, and it's fairly simple. You just need a little bit of glassware, a little bit of dye, and a cuvette, and uh, and I'll provide everything for day one here. And um, and then after that, right, we're going to do experiment one, which is HPLC analysis of caffeine and benzoic acid in Diet Coke. And there's also a spreadsheet for this guy, right? There's a lot of instructions here on how to do it. Um, and we're gonna do it all in these centrifuge vials. And then um, basically we do it according to this spreadsheet and we're gonna put in, gonna tear the centrifuge vial, put in some caffeine benzoic, uh, tear the mixture, and then we'll make dilutions of that or not. And all we need to do really is get all of these values into um, a, into that um, spreadsheet, and then that'll spit out the concentrations. And we can do um, this larger spreadsheet here, where we put the um, uh, concentrations and the signals that come out of the HPLC into this spreadsheet, and that'll give us the um, all of the statistics that we need to. Uh, hopefully draw some conclusions from this data. So anyhow, that's just a heads up on this. This is the lab manual. The lab report consists of these five elements and, um, and, and a little bit of narrative. And, and we, we can talk a little bit more about that, but it should all be here. And um, that's pretty much all I've got to say for today. Um, uh, I, um, the lab manual is subject to some change because I could, um, I might change it a little bit um, uh, before the end of the semester, but uh, experiments one and two, or zero, one and two are probably pretty much final. Um, and uh, yeah, so I think, uh, I think that's all I wanted to say for today. Um, So I will see everybody, I'll see everybody on Wednesday lab, on Wednesday morning. Then uh, also Wednesday night, we'll have lecture again online. And uh, I'll have a final answer for y'all about whether we're gonna keep it online or uh, go into classroom. Alrighty, any questions for today? All righty, guys, you have a great night. Thank you for your attention. I hope you learned a little something. And yes, yeah, so, so no, no Tuesday lab tomorrow. No, um, there's no Zoom or anything, no Tuesday lab at all tomorrow. We're gonna start the labs exactly one week late, which is Wednesday. So um, yeah, it kind of keeps us on, on track. All righty, guys, see you soon. <laughs>